We're so old, we're talking about the pagers. You used to have to carry <laughs> when you were <laughs> So when I was the duty officer at the beginning, we had a pager, the duty officer pager. And I had a little thing on my yeah. belt. This, this, we didn't even really have cell phones, but it was just, it would beep. Yeah. And then I'd go to a pay phone and call And in. call the sit room. Yeah. Um, so the sit room on January 6th, let me read what's in the book. Um, with reports coming in from the Secret Service and other officials on Capitol Hill, the Situation Room scrambled into action. Quote, things got very chaotic. Um, this is Mike Stigler, the Situation Room officer. He told you, quote, we went into a continuity of government situation. Stop there. Take in that phrase, Continu continuity of government situation. That bland bit of bureaucratic jargon masks a deadly serious set of policies and actions first ordered by President Eisenhower at the height of the Cold War. COG was designed to ensure that the government would still function after a disaster such as nuclear war. It involved secret command centers, the sit room being a critical one, elaborate chains of command, the relocation of Congress, and the replacement of executive branch officials killed in attacks. It had been activated only once before in the immediate aftermath of the September 11th, 2001 terror attacks. When Mike Stiegler told me that on the Zoom, I stopped breathing. Think I didn't know that. that. Did, did, has that been? I, it was the first time I had heard it. You know, we tried to, we tried to run it down, and we know that it happened on 9-11. As well, but think about that. He was on the phone with the Secret Service. He was on the phone with others on Capitol Hill who were telling him the vice president's life is in danger. And he tells me the most horrible part of that day is not knowing if the Pence is going to make it through that day. And they're planning for an alternate government to be set up. What is the President of the United States doing? We all know what the President of the United States was doing. He's sitting up in his study, sipping Diet Coats, and sending out a tweet attacking. Mike Pence did not call down to the Situation Room once during that insurrection. What is it? I mean, you take you could take any corner right on the 18 acres, and then he debased it, right? Um, he, you know, from from his post-COVID ripping. I mean, the whole thing. But there's something about the sit room where shit was always so real, right? N nothing, whatever, whatever, e even if there were fights going on between, you got in the sit room because something bad was happening. Something bad was happening. And they're getting incoming 24 hours a day, seven days a week. A lot of it turns out to be false, but they're on the front lines taking in all of this information. And think about the history of the Situation Room. They've dealt with assassinations. They've dealt with attempted assassinations. They've dealt with 9-11. They've dealt with wars. They had never had to deal with an insurrection inspired by the president himself. And the people in the sit room, Mike Steger, one of them, he said it took him years to process what was happening that day. He and his, his friends who served that day couldn't speak. They had to go to work the next day, but they couldn't speak when they left the White House that day. And they still meet every January 6th. They go to the Lincoln Memorial and raise a glass to the fact that at least the Republic stood, the Republic did survive that day, but they had to deal with something that is, is, is really unimaginable in our times. And now, again, to go back to what we talked about at the beginning, people want to make it seem like it was normal. I think about, I mean, obviously, I was in the White House on September 11th when COG was put in place and the pictures, I mean, Cheney right. and Mary Madeline, you, 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 yeah. you were covering the, the Bush White House in which I served. Um, talked to, to my boss, Dan Bartlett, yeah. every day. I remember <laughs> I was sitting there, who's that is George? And I, you know, and, and you had all the best information, all the best reporting. And, and we actually tried to the extent we, we could talk about what was going on. But the country ag agreed on the horror of that day. And I don't think anything takes away the pain, and I'm not trying to compare the two tragedies, but in terms of our telling and our story as a country, there's not a lot of divisiveness around the story we tell about September 11th. I wonder what it's like for the men and women who worked in the Situation Room or the men and women who, who defended the United States Capitol, and they weren't protecting the Democrats or the Republicans. They paid with their bodies. Some of them paid with their jobs. Some of them paid with they their lives. They were protecting the institutions. Right. And, you know, it, it, I, I spoke with Mike Stiegler again last week, and one of the things that gratified me is that um, after we, we, we talked to him and, and, and showed him a Good Morning America, he sent me a text in the morning thanking me because he said since he's spoken out, several of his colleagues have now felt more able to process it, more able to talk about it, able to put it uh, into context. For the long time, they felt like uh, they couldn't talk about it and they couldn't understand what had happened and they didn't necessarily have the support and they've found, they've, they've found the support uh, among each other. You know, I wonder, 
if you take the events of Waco and you take Oklahoma City and you put some of the characters on the board again, I mean, Merrick Garland prosecutes Oklahoma City. Donald Trump announces his candidacy in Waco, and Donald Trump is taunting Merrick Garland for wanting to hold him accountable for January 6th. How do all the pieces fit together in your head? Well, I mean, I, I think that there is a there's a, there's been a lot of anger in America for a long time, and Donald Trump has tapped into it. There's just no question about that. An anti-establishment anger. What what's, what surprised me more is what was relatively small, considered extreme group has now become the majority inside the Republican Party. I think that's in in some ways the the, the most important story to figure out and the most important story to reveal. I mean, it's 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 the enablers who've who've made all of this possible. You know, this could have ended in January 2021. Mm -hmm. There could have been a conviction. That could have been, and mm -hmm. you have a lot of people like Mitch McConnell who said, well, we're not going to vote for conviction because he should be tried in a court of law. And now somehow that's illegitimate as well. But it's not even over yet. And I know you know this, Nicole, but think about this. Right now, the, the President Trump continues to lie about the election every single day mm -hmm. in every single statement and to, to not promise to accept the results if it doesn't go his way in 2024. And you have people falling in line behind yeah, that. Yeah, Rubio just well. fell. Rubio did on, on Meet the Press on yeah. Sunday. Yeah. So what do we do? How do you cover Rubio as someone who won't accept the results of an election that hasn't happened? I, I, that, I would stop asking the questions after I got that answer. I'm not going to talk to you about anything else. What are, you, are you optimistic about the country? I'm optimistic about the people. I'm inspired by the people I interviewed yeah. for this book. I mean, there are an awful lot of good people working every single day across this government uh, who are trying to do their best for the country, for the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's just not an overstatement to say this is the most important election we've seen in our lifetime. It just isn't. Um, and I think... You tell me what happens in the election, and I'll give you an answer on what I think is going to happen in the day after, because I think it's about the rule of law. It's about the Constitution. It's about the peaceful transfer of power. It's not about politics. It's not about Republican and Democrat. It's about the bedrock of our democracy. I agree, but I do think there's only one party standing for those things. Both, both sides are not, are not engaged right now. Right. in the same enterprise, in debates based on facts, in the rule of law, in abiding by the Constitution and the peaceful transfer of power. And those are the most important issues.